All right, good evening, brothers and sisters, both online and offline, physical, spiritual, virtual. <laughs> All right, so today um, we're starting a new series, you know, and I'll be taking the topic about leadership, um, the leadership secrets of Jesus. The leadership secrets of Jesus. Trust me, if there is anybody you need to learn something from, is that man or God that came as man called Jesus. You know, the leadership secrets of Jesus. Leadership is simply about influence. Simply put, leadership is influence. As a leader, you should be able to influence people to the point where they are inspired to achieve a particular goal without necessarily you having a title. So you don't have to be the leader of a unit to be a leader. Some people have said that, oh, leaders are born. Some people have said leaders are made. One of the things I like to say is that there can be a gift of leadership bestowed upon you by God. But the truth is that so many times it's the responsibility of leadership that requires us to take decisions. It is the responsibility of leadership that requires us to take decisions. So leadership is about influence. So we're going to learn about, when we say leadership secrets, we're going to learn about the, the things that made Jesus have the kind of influence that he, he has had over generations. Do you know that... Jesus' ministry was just for three years. Can you imagine that? It was just for three years. And that influence has remained from generation to generation. Imagine that kind of impact. That somebody was just, you know, ministering to people for three years. Pastor K. And the entire generations unborn will still continue to talk about him. It must have been something else. So we're going to be learning those secret wisdom that you know, Jesus used in influencing people. So much that even Romans 12, 1 to 2 ad admonishes us that when we align our life, you know, not conforming to the, to, to the systems of the world, but aligning our lives to these tenets that Jesus left behind, that we are able to be transformed. That, that is basically what that scripture is talking about. You know, but I've come to also discover that it was Jesus' mindset that, you know, really made him do what he did. More than even the principles that he left behind. It was more of his mindset. And I feel that those secrets are hidden in, the, in how he saw life and saw people. How the things he spoke, the things he believed in, how he felt compassion, and how he did his things. I believe that to understand a man, it's beyond studying what he has done or what he does. You need to understand why he does them. So sometimes it is more, even, it is more important to understand the mindset of who you are working with, who the leader is in that place. If you are a leader yourself, people need to first understand why you do what you do. So that is what we are going to look at today. Even scripture tells us in Philippians 2 from verse 5 that we should have the same mindset that Christ had. And I'll read. It says Philippians 2 from verse 5 to 8. It says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Let me go. To, this is the NLT. Let me do the NKJV. It says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Basically, God stepped down to our level. He says, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So this same mindset is the mindset we should carry, the mindset of humility. If you want to be a leader, 
that will influence people. I don't know how many people like leaders that are very proud, are very condescending in the way they talk to them. Nobody likes that kind of leader. Imagine that you see a leader that you respect so much. Come sit down with you, you know, engage you, talk to you. You, you will feel some level of importance. And that leader can almost tell you to do anything and you'll be ready to do it for that person. Some of the best football coaches have been said to be people that knew how to relate with their, with their, with, 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 with their teams, how to get the best out of them, how to relate to them in such a way that these players are ready to play out their hearts for the coaches. A leader can also be looked at from that angle. And it was John Maxwell that was talking about the strategy of adding value to people. And he listed four things, and I saw these four things in Jesus. He says, no, the first thing, if you want to add value to men, is that you must value people. You must value people. Both in this case, both sinners and saints. I've come to see that a lot of times in the Christendom, we, we value people that are doing right more than the people that are doing wrong. In fact, sometimes we do not even want to see those people that are doing wrong. They are the bad sheep. They are the bad eggs. We do not want to relate to them. Forgetting that Jesus died for those sinners. Our light is not meant to shine to ourselves. Our light is meant to shine to where? To the world. To that dying world. So the first thing is that you must value people. Whether they are sinners or they are saints. Because to everybody, God sees them as souls. So you must value people. The second thing is that you must be valuable yourself. Be there for people. At whatever aspects of their journey that they, that they find themselves. You must be there for people. Come through for people. Reach out to people. Encourage people. Help them to pass through the different phases of their lives. So you too must be valuable to others. The third one says, you must know the people and relate to what they also value. You must relate with people and know what they also value. You know, it was Del Carnegie that said that you will make more friends in two months by being interested in what they are interested in than you will make in two years by trying to get them to be interested in what you are interested in. So it's about caring for people. And the, top, the fourth one, you have to do the things that God values. You have to do the things that God values. So I wrote out five things that I feel that were the secrets of Jesus Christ. How we saw things. How we said things. How we believed things. How we felt things and how we did things. Jesus saw situations different from how every other person saw them. He believed in people more than even them believed in themselves. Everybody wants that leader that believes in him. That sees you for the potential that God has put in you. You know, it's easy to see somebody making mistakes and say, you, you're a loser. You, you can never amount to something. Or you can never amount to anything. But imagine that leader coming to tell you, that see your best years are ahead of you. That you're a great person. That was Jesus. Jesus spoke out the greatness out of people's lives. That is the kind of leader. Whether you, you have become a leader as a gift from God. Or responsibility has placed you as a leader. Whether you have a title or you do not have a title. Whether you are called into a position or not. It is that we will look at these secrets. And start to, from this evening, from this night, from this day, be a blessing to people by speaking and seeing the best in the, in the lives of people. And the first person I want us to look at is the, is, the, is the Samaritan woman. Time will not permit me to read all the scriptures that I have written down. I will probably, from each of the things I'm discussing, I will probably just look at one or two scriptures. We all know the Samaritan woman, the woman by the well. Jesus came to her and just was having a discussion. And the Jews 
always looked down on the Samaritan. So the woman did not even expect Jesus to engage her. And she said, ah, why are you engaging me? You are, you are a Jew. You know, you people always, you know, basically think that you are superior. And Jesus was saying, you know what? Um, maybe you should get me water to drink. And the woman was saying, ah, what, 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 how can you ask me that kind of favor? You know, and Jesus was saying that if you knew who was asking you this, you would know that even me, I'm the giver of the living water. And the woman misunderstood it, thinking that God was saying that I will, I, there's a type of water I can fetch for you and you drink and you will test no more. And as the woman inquired, Jesus engaged him further and said, you know what, go get your husband. Jesus was driving at something. And the woman said, no, I don't know have a husband. And Jesus said, yeah, you said right. You've been married to five, and even this sixth one is not your husband. And the woman said, oh, wow, I perceive that you're a prophet. But one thing that was important is that the woman from that moment felt important with herself. That this prophet that was a Jew came and was having a conversation with me. He, he felt I was important enough to have a conversation with me. You will see how other leaders see the women or saw the Samaritan woman when the disciples, other disciples came and said, ah, basically wondering why God was talking to this woman. But in that woman, people saw a serial divorcee. But Jesus saw somebody that was a great evangelist. And this woman went into town and won an entire city to God. Can you imagine that? What a way to influence an entire city. Just by seeing that woman the way that, you know, God has seen her. There are so many stories like that across scriptures. I'm sure you remember the woman with the alabaster box. And I think we should actually read that because that is one of the greatest stories I've read in scriptures. Somebody that everybody knew in town was it. In fact, Amplified Version said something about being major, the woman majored in sinning. <laughs> Can you imagine that? That the woman was, was a heavy sinner. We'll find out in Luke 7 from 36. Luke 7 from verse 36. He said, then one of the Pharisees asked him, which Jesus in this case, to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. Let me, let me check the amplified version for how we explain that. He said, now there was a woman in the city who was known as a sinner. And when she found out that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began wetting his feet with her tears and wiped them with her, the hair of her head and respectfully kissed his feet as an act of signifying both her affection and submission and anointed them with the perfume. Now, when Simon the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, and this was his own thought, not like he said it out, he said, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a notorious sinner, an outcast devoted to sin. Can you imagine that? Imagine the way this man analyzed this woman. That this woman is devoted to sin. How can you say somebody is devoted to sin? What a, a demeaning way to, to, to see somebody. There, basically, there was no hope in this woman left to that man called Simon the Pharisee. But see what Jesus said. Jesus answering said to the Pharisee, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he, re and he replied, teacher, say it. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they had no means of repaying the debts, he freely forgave both of them. Which of them do you think will love him more? Basically, he was trying to say, see, 
to you, you are self-righteous. You believe that you, you know, you, you deserve my presence. But this woman has looked at herself and, you know, thought to herself that, see, I do not deserve this man, but I'm going to go humbly myself in reverence. And Jesus was trying to let him know that, see, this woman will love me more because I forgave more. Imagine the logic that because the person that I forgave more will natural love me, naturally love me more. So Jesus understood how to see people the way they should be seen, the way God saw them. And we know of the man also called Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector. I mean, he was somebody hated by, by people in, in town. But Jesus, he heard that Jesus came to town. He was a short man, climbed a tree and started shouting. And Jesus basically gave him attention and said, you know what, today I'm going to eat at your house. And everybody was upset with him. At the end of the day, Jesus did not come for people that feel that they are self-righteous. It's those people like those politicians that we think that God does not love. Those are the people that God came for. It does not profit God anything for any man to perish. And it is important that we start to see things from the way God sees things. And if you look at Luke 37, Luke 7, verse 35, you would understand the mindset of God. If, let's look at it from verse 33. Luke 7, 33. It says, For John the Baptist has come neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at a man who is a glutton and a heavy wine drinker, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, including non-observant Jews. Yet wisdom is vindicated and shown to be right by all our children, by the lifestyle, moral character, and good deeds of our followers. So this is what basically makes God, you know, see people differently. Because the proof of wisdom is in the results, is in the outcome of that person. That is how God sees people. And that's how we should also see people. So there was a special way God saw people, God saw men. And another thing also is that there was a way God also spoke. Jesus also spoke with courage. It was one of the things that made him have influence. He spoke understanding that for everything he said, he was either winning men to, to God or chasing men away. So he focused more on winning men to God. He spoke boldly to the Pharisees because the Pharisees and Sadducees basically were the ones being a stumbling block to men coming to Christ. He spoke boldly to them. There are some things that we should watch when we speak. We need to be careful how we speak. There are things we say that we either bring men to God or chase men further away from God. Jesus understood this. And it was why he had so much influence. Because he did not speak carelessly. Yes, he would address these Pharisees and basically rebuke them. But he would come to his disciples and his, the people, you know, he was discipling. And he would encourage them. He would encourage them. He would engage them. If you look at Matthew 9 from verse 10. From verse 10 to 12. Let's look at Matthew 9. To see how God engaged how Jesus engaged um, the Pharisees in one of those instances. Matthew 9 from verse 10. It says, then as Jesus was reclining at the table in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners, including non-observant Jews, came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but only those who are sick. Go and learn what this scripture means. I desire compassion for those in distress and not animal sacrifice. For I did not come to call to repentance the self-proclaimed righteous who see no need to change, but sinners 
those who recognize their sin and actively seek forgiveness. So basically, Jesus addressed these people and said, the people I came for are the sinners. Not you people that think you are self-righteous. It's the people that know that they are sinners and they are seeking forgiveness. That was the kind of Jesus we had. It was somebody that was bold enough to address issues. In Luke 22 from 24, you will see where the, 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 the disciples were arguing over who was going to be the greatest. And Jesus called them together and said, Oga, there's nothing like if you want to be greatest, you have to, you, you have to be the leader or you have to be bossing it over people. He said, the Gentiles lord it over others. But for us, whoever is going to be the first must first take the humble place and be a servant. How many of us are willing to be servants today? Everybody wants to sit at the high table. Everybody wants to be the head. You get to an event, you want to sit in front. But Jesus is saying here that whoever must be the leader has to first take a back seat and humble himself. There was a conflict too. The mother of, 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 of John and James, Matthew 20, came to meet Jesus and said, you know, basically fighting for political positions. And said, please, can you put my, my sons on the left and on the right when your... <laughs> I'm sure they were... The mother was thinking of, about, you know, Israel being restored as a nation and basically the political positions he was going to get for his children. He didn't understand that God at that point was here for a different mission. From verse 20, Matthew 20. James and John, the, their mother, came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down in respect, asked for a favor. And Jesus asked him, what do you, what do you wish for? And he said, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit in positions of honor and authority, one to your right and one to your left. <laughs> but Jesus replied, you do not realize what you are asking. Are you able to drink of the cup of suffering that I am about to drink? The answer we are able. If you jump to verse 24, it says that when the others, the other 10 disciples heard, they were really angry. And a fight almost burst out. But what a leader does is what Jesus did. He called them all together and engaged them. You have to engage as a leader. Don't be afraid to resolve conflict. Jesus basically addressed them and said, no. There's nobody here that is trying to get any position. If you really want a position, you must first serve. 28 says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, paying the price to set them free from the penalty of sin. So even Jesus came to serve. So Jesus was a Jesus that, you know, spoke with boldness, addressed issues with boldness. And it was one of the things that made him have the kind of influence that he had. The third one is that Jesus believed in people. Imagine, making, imagine believing that a fisherman can be a fisher of men. Of all the occupations, you, you wouldn't have thought someone like Peter would be a choice of Jesus. Remember that there's a scripture that they said they, the, 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 the people discovered that these people were not learned. Right? But they knew that they had been with Jesus. Imagine, a, you know, in today's ministry, getting somebody that is an illiterate as one of your disciples. You almost think that, what kind of impact would I make? But Jesus never looked at those academic qualifications. Jesus focused more on the heart of the men. Jesus picked a fisherman. He believed in a thief on the cross. Can you imagine that? That the first person Jesus went back to heaven with was a thief. You see that we have hope. If there's anything that you should just understand today is that, see, no matter where you are at in your life, there's a Jesus that believes in you. And there's something somebody believing in you does to you. It just helps you to align. 
Even when you are misbehaving and somebody keeps telling you that I believe in you, I know that you are great. I know that this is not, this is not the best you, you are, you, the best, you know, of you is, is, is ahead of you. And the person keeps believing and speaking positive things into your life. Then it's just a matter of time that greatness will start to shine or show forth in your life. So Jesus was somebody that believed. In fact, he believed so much in men that he actually sent the disciples out to go and, you know, witness without following them. He sent them two by two. You'll find out in Luke 10 from verse 1. He says, now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them out ahead of him two by two into every city and place where he was about to go. He was saying to them, the harvest is abundant. For there are many who need to hear the good news. So basically, Jesus sent them out to preach. He did not micromanage. He delegated. And if you go to verse 17, he says, When the 70 returned, with, he said the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. Listen carefully. I have given you authority that you now possess to tread upon serpents and scorpions and the ability to exercise authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means harm you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. So Jesus was a Jesus that believed in men. He sent them out. He did not micromanage them. He equipped them with the right mindset. You know, it was somebody called Rudy Giuliani. He was a mayor of New York some years back. The crime rate in New York was so crazy that they robbery every day, murder, everything. So when he became the mayor of New York, he came into town, and there were seven police chiefs. And he called the seven police chiefs, and he asked them, that, do you believe that crime can be caught in this city below half of what is happening now. And five of the police chiefs said, ah, <laughs> this place is not possible. This place is known for crime. It's the a, it's a crime capital of the world. It's not possible that you, it will, crime will fall below, below 50%. The other two said, well, we believe. If we put in the work, we believe. Rudy Giuliani sacked five of them. He sacked five of them. He said, I don't want to work with somebody that do not, does not even believe that they can, they can make a change. That was the person Jesus was. Jesus was somebody that believed in men. And there's no how you believe in men that you will not have influence over them. There's no how you are going to believe in men that you will not have influence over them. And the fourth point was that Jesus was a man that had compassion. As a leader, it's something you must have. You can't have people following you and not be compassionate. Most of the places where Jesus healed men or fed people, it was as a result of compassion. You know, Scripture says we do not have a high priest who is not touched by the feelings of our infirmity. Because he was also tested and he went through the same things we went through, even though he did not sin. So Jesus understood and still understands that man in his real nature is weak and only needs him or needs God for strength. So Jesus understands our situations. So very comp compassionate. Always there for people. He fed the, fed the people out of compassion. He ca always came down to people's levels. He even cried over Jerusalem. Can you imagine Jesus crying? Jesus, why should you cry? You are God. You are almighty. But that's to tell you how compassionate Jesus was. He felt people's pains. Compassion for all his actions. You know, it takes a broken heart to connect with a broken world. And Jesus understood this. Don't be those, one of those leaders that is, is on a high horse looking down on everybody and saying these ones. They, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't, you know, there's they, so much spiritual pride in church. 
looking down on others. I am more spiritual than you. Spirituality is with humility. The more spiritual you are, the more humble you are. Because scripture says, let he that thinks he stands take heed, lest he falls. Even Jesus, that had a right to look down on us, did not look down on us. So there's a need for us to be compassionate as leaders. Come down from your high horse. Look at people and look at them with the eyes that God is looking at them with. The last but not the least, because of time, so that we can take questions, is that is, is how God did what he did, or how Jesus did what he did. He did beyond what other religious leaders couldn't do. He had a very fruitful ministry. Generations unborn are still talking about him just for three years of ministry. He sat with sinners and engaged them. Jesus must have been a very interesting person. How many pastors do you think today, or how many leaders do you think today can sit with sinners and actually have a good conversation with them? These days, you almost see a pastor sit down with you and you don't even want to talk, talk because you're like, ah, I beg, I don't want to open up. This man is too holy for me. Jesus came across as somebody that could relate with them. He was a socially empowered and connected, and he was connected with people. So connected that his first miracle was at a wedding. I feel like the part of Jesus where, where I embody more is the social side, I guess. I mean, Pastor K. This, <laughs> I, was more, I, am more, I am more tilted towards the social Jesus. You know? But yes, we need to strike a balance. There was also the spiritual Jesus that separated himself to go pray. Where others were, you know, sleeping and all that, Jesus was praying. So let's not focus too much on the social Jesus because I know that you'll be happy to hear the side of Jesus that went to the wedding and parted. But Jesus was somebody that could... Imagine Luke 7, when we read earlier, they were abusing Jesus that he was just hanging out with sinners and all that. And Jesus was like, you don't understand. These are the people I came for. These are the people I came for. So Jesus would come, engage them, and basically win them over. So, you are not going there to forgetting who you are. You are going there as an ambassador of Christ. Engage them. When they bring up topics in, in those social circles, bring up topics, say things that will make people start to think about the need to, to realign with God. Don't go there and forget who you are. That's what, that was the kind of person Jesus was. And I wrote here that Jesus also was not, you know, a coward. He was ready to contend. You remember him going into the temple in Matthew 21 from verse 8 to 12 and flogged people that were messing up out, out of the temple. I wrote here that Jesus was both a lion and a lamb. You know, as Christians, yes, most times we are the lamb, but sometimes you need to show people that you also have the lion in you. So Jesus contended with people that were trying to, you know, defile the temple of God. And yes, there will be instances where we need to rebuke people. There will be instances where we need to rebuke people, but may God give us wisdom to do that at the right time. And Jesus, after all this, said, greater works shall you do. In John 14, verse 12 to 14. He said, greater works, all these things that I have done, greater you shall do. I am here to submit to you that the influence that Jesus had in leadership was as a result of how we saw people or how we saw situations, how we spoke, how we believed in people, what he did, and how we had compassion. That is what who a leader is. With these few words of mine, I hope I've been able to convince you and not to confuse you that Jesus was the most influential leader that ever lived. Is still influencing this generation and generations that we yet, are yet to come. By the special grace of God, may we find grace to be like Jesus. In Jesus' name.